Okay, the plan today is to finish the Gospel of John. So I, it's our nine-month journey. I hope it's been helpful to you. But that's the plan to finish today. Now, last week we saw that on the Sunday of the Lord's resurrection, late that afternoon that Jesus appeared, the disciples were gathered together in a room and Jesus appeared there. Then a week later, on the following Sunday, they are again gathered together in a room and the Lord appears. And at that time, he accommodates Thomas's skepticism by allowing him or having him feel uh, his wounds. And then Thomas exclaims, my Lord and my God. And Jesus promised a blessing on all who believe without having seen him physically. So he, he, he accommodates Thomas's hyper skepticism for various reasons. And then he announces this blessing on all those you, you've seen and believed. Blessed are those who believe without having seen. And that's all of us. Then it, this section of John concludes with verses 30 to 31. It says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John declares that the many miracles done by Jesus that he reported in the gospel, he says that those many miracles were just a sampling of the greater number of miracles that Jesus did in the presence of the disciples. So John tells us that he's been deliberately selective in the miracles that he reports. So it's no surprise that some miraculous works of Jesus that are reported in the synoptic gospels are not reported in John because John is telling us I'm being deliberately selective to present these things for a specific purpose. The miraculous works that he did report in his gospel, he says, they were told so that you may believe Jesus is who he is said to be in this gospel. That is, that he is the Christ, the Son of God. That's why he's reported these things. And as I indicated in the introduction, when John's, what John means when he says, so that you, you know, he says here, so that you may believe. And what I think John is saying is there, so that you may continue in belief, so that you may be strengthened in your belief and so that you may come to believe. In other words, I think John is dealing here with a dual purpose. He wanted both to win the lost, to bring the unbeliever to belief, but he also wanted to strengthen the belief of those who already believe. So when he says, I write these things that you may believe, I think he has that dual purpose in mind, and that dual purpose would have been pursued by directing his gospel to the church. So he wants to, he has an evangelistic purpose. He wants to bring people to belief, but he also wants to fortify the belief of those who already believe. And he, he accomplishes that dual purpose by writing to the church. And as Ke uh, Kostenberger, Kellum, and Quarles say in their introduction to the New Testament, it says, it seems that John's purpose encompassed both aspects, evangelism of unbelievers and edification of believers, and that John pursued an indirect evangelistic purpose aiming to reach an unbelieving audience through the Christian readers of his gospel. So that's what makes sense to me, is that with this dual purpose, the testimony that circulated within the church, he directs his gospel to the community of faith, and that testimony that circulated within the church that would be, then become the basis of outreach to others. So he sends it to the church. His purpose is both to strengthen and to evangelize. And from by sending it that way, that message and that gospel then becomes the basis of outreach and telling people. Now, as John has stressed throughout, throughout the, his gospel, it's through faith in Jesus that one receives the gift of eternal life. That's, that's clear John has made that point so clearly. 
And though a, dis a distorted focus on miracles can yield a superficial and flawed faith, miracles do have a proper role to play in the development and strengthening of faith. John is telling us that. He says, the reason I've reported these things is for your faith, for its development. So there's care that's needed in dealing with miracles. You can have this, uh, this distorted focus on it that results in that superficial or flawed faith, but they do have a proper purpose to play, and that's why he's given them. Now, this is, looks like the ending of the book, right? He says, I did these things, these are written so that. But there is an epilogue to the Gospel of John. And as, as commonly divided, you have the prologue of John, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. Then you have the book of signs, John chapter 1, verse 19 through chapter 12. Then you have the book of glory, which is chapters 13 through 20. And then you get this epilogue which is chapter 21, where you have these appearances of, the, of Jesus to the disciples in Galilee. And that's, this, that's this known that way. So the first, chapter 12, verses 1 to 14, we have Jesus appearing to the seven disciples. So he says in John 21, beginning in verse 1, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And in fact, my grandson is right now in Tiberias. So he's over there with Harding University. So he was texting me this morning. That's pretty cool. Sea of Tiberias is just another name of the Sea of Galilee. And by the late first century, it was known as the Sea of Tiberias when John is writing. He says, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And their reasons are a good ways away. It says, Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, John. Therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got on, the, on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and so would the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, Matthew and Mark, those gospels, they reveal that Jesus intended to meet with the disciples in Galilee after his resurrection. Okay, Jerusalem's in Judea. Galilee is the region up to the north. He had intended to meet with the disciples in Galilee after his resurrection. You see that in Matthew 26, 32 and 28, 7, Mark 14, 28 and 16, 7. Now the resurrection appearances in Jerusalem that are reported in Luke chapter 24 and in John chapter 20, 
they're not inconsistent with that intention of Jesus to meet with the disciples in Galilee. Rather, as Gary Burge says in his commentary, he says, the disciples have simply been instructed to return to what had been their base, Galilee, what had been their, their base throughout Jesus' ministry, and there receive further instructions. And here in John chapter 21, seven of the disciples are fishing there in the Sea of Galilee, which is here called the Sea of Tiberias. And the seven disciples, they're Peter, Thomas the twin, Nathaniel, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and there are two unnamed disciples. So you have seven of the apostles here. They had fished during the night and had caught nothing. So they're out there casting those nets and doing all that fishermen do, and they drew a blank. And that presumably, so, so they're doing that. So just as day is breaking, they've been out there all night fishing. They got zero. And as day's breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, but it says, but the disciples didn't recognize him, and that recognize him, and that was presumably because the boat, he says it's about a hundred yards offshore. And it's just daylight, just coming. So the light is quite dim. He's a hundred yards away. There's this guy on the shore and they don't recognize him as Jesus. But Jesus calls out to them asking if they had any fish. And they said, no, we whiffed. We don't have any fish. And he then tells them, he tells them to cast the net to go ahead and cast the net on the right side of the boat, which they do. And that's an interesting thing that they do. You know, they, they wind up doing that, maybe thinking there's enough chance that this stranger had some novel insight into the location of fish on that occasion to make it worth a try. You know, it just strikes me as interesting. These fishermen, this guy on the, on the shore, they don't recognize him. He calls out. He says, hey, why don't you try casting on the right side? And they go ahead and do it. Now, maybe it was a cultural thing. They said, you know, it'd be insulting to this guy. But I like what D.A. Carson says. Carson says, it's hard to see how Jesus' exhortation to throw the net on the starboard side greatly differs from advice contemporary sports fishermen have to endure and occasionally appreciate. Try casting over there. You often catch them over there. So for whatever reason, whether it's simply to be polite, whether they think, well, there's a chance that this guy has some insight into how things are working here right at this time that makes it worth it, because after all, we've whiffed. But for whatever reason, they go ahead and they cast the net over on that side. And when they followed Jesus' advice, they caught so many fish, they couldn't even pull the net into the boat. Now we learn later, you can see why, because they, they weren't small fish. These are big fish. And there's 153 of them. They can't lift this net up and get it into the boat. Now maybe recalling that event, I feel certain, in my mind anyway, that what this would do... This episode, as soon as that happened, this guy on the shore that they don't recognize, they go ahead and for some reason they follow his advice, they cast on the right side of the boat, and all of a sudden they fished all night, they get nothing. Now they listen to this guy, they throw over here, and they get so many fish they can't even haul it in. And as soon as that happened, I'm sure John said that when he calls out, it's the Lord, it's because he remembered Luke chapter 5, the earlier episode of the similar event. And as soon as that happened, the light went off and he said, it's the Lord. He knew from the similarity of what had happened before that this was in fact the Lord. And as soon as he said that, Peter right behind him, right? The penny dropped for Peter right after John. And he understood it and he knew that too. He says, it's the Lord. Peter hears that, knows that that's right, knows that that's true from the same experience he'd had in Luke chapter 5. So he did something with his garment. I put it that way, I'll explain in a second. He did something with his garment and jumped into the water to swim to shore. 
Now, what did he do with his garment? Here's what the English Standard Version, the note in the English Standard Version says, and I think it's helpful. He says, Peter's behavior here has been puzzling to many interpreters, right? Because it's odd for you to put on a cloak to go swim. I mean, it just, it just seems like an odd thing. He says, it's been puzzling to many interpreters. He says, it's usually understood that the Greek word gumnas, uh, usually translated naked, that it does not refer to complete nudity, as it could. I mean, that's within the range of meaning of that word is complete nudity. But it's generally understood that in this particular case, it is not referring to complete nudity, since this would have been offensive to Jewish sensibilities in this historical context. So interpreters think, no, that's, it's not talking about total nudity, it is thus commonly understood to mean stripped for work here. And I think that's how the ESV renders it. That is, with one's outer clothing removed, and Peter was wearing either a loincloth or a loose-fitting tunic, a long shirt-like garment worn under a cloak. For he was, the New American Bible says, for he was lightly clad. Okay, so that's the typical way of looking at it. Believing himself inadequately dressed because he had taken off his outer garment and only had this tunic or this loincloth on, inadequately dressed to greet the Lord, Peter threw on his outer garment around himself and dived into the sea and then swims to shore. So that's how it's typically understood, but I agree that that seems like an odd thing to do, to throw on this outer garment to swim in. Okay, I guess you could say he's doing it because he thinks it's improper to be approaching Jesus like that. But R.E., that's Raymond Brown's suggestion decades ago in his commentary on John. This is the ESV note we're reading from. It says, seems much more probable here. Now, here's how Raymond Brown, his take on what's going on here. He says, the Greek verb used, diazonumi, does not necessarily mean putting clothing on, but rather tying the clothing around oneself. The same verb is used in chapter 13, verses 4 and 5, of Jesus tying the towel around himself. The statement that Peter was, quote, naked could just as well mean that he was naked underneath the outer garment. In other words, the only thing he had on was the outer garment. Not that he had taken the outer garment off and had just a tunic or a loincloth. That he kept the outer garment on and had taken off the tunic or the loincloth. He says, thus could not, he says, the statement that Peter was, quote, naked could just as well mean that he, that he was naked underneath the outer garment and thus could not take it off before jumping into the water because he'd then be completely naked. Okay, he goes on and says, but he did pause to tuck it up and tie it with the girdle before jumping in to allow himself more freedom of movement. So this idea is that he's naked under the outer garment and what he does then before he jumps in the water is he can't take it off. He would then be naked. He ties it up to keep it from being so restrictive as he jumps in to swim ashore. He says, thus the clause that, that states Peter was naked is explanatory. Note the use of for explaining why Peter girded up his outer garment rather than taking it off. He had nothing on underneath it and so could not remove it. Okay, so that, there, there's some question about exactly what's going on with Peter here. But in any event, he hears that it, when he says it's the Lord, he knows that's right. The same light goes off for him, and he's going ashore because he's that excited and wants to see the Lord. Now, the other disciples followed in the boat, and they're dragging this net full of fish. So they're following. They're about 100 yards out. Peter's booking it for the shore, and they come with the boat dragging this, this ton of fish they have here. The 153 large fish, and when they landed, they saw a charcoal fire and fish on it and some bread. So the Lord's here cooking. (laughs) You know, he's here, he's here on the beach, and he's there, he's cooking. They got some fish going, he's got some bread there, and then Jesus tells them to bring some of the fish that they just caught. 
because he doesn't have enough on the grill to feed all these hungry fishermen. So, you know, he's got something there. But now he's adding a lot of mouths to feed. So he says, hey, bring some of the fish that you just caught. That, by the way, I told you to go. I told you to go on the right side and you caught them. But he says, bring some of those fish so he can feed all of the mouths that he's got to feed there. And that's what they wind, that's what they, they do. That's going to be needed. And then Peter, it says, Peter went out. See, I modified this. I think the ESV said, so Simon Peter went aboard, which sounds like he goes out. So he's come to shore. They, they've brought the boat in, dragging the net full of fish. And when it says he went up or went aboard the way the ESV does it, sounds like he went on board. But the fish aren't on board. They couldn't get the fish on board. So what I think he's saying is he went up to the boat that is in shallow water now, and he grabs the net full of the fish, and he pulls that to shore. This is what J. Ramsey Michaels in his commentary says, went up could mean that he got back into the boat, but more likely he came up to the boat in order to bring the loaded net still lying in shallow water onto land. And so I changed that and put went up instead of went aboard. But that's good. That's what I think is, is going on there. So he goes up and, and Peter then drags ashore the haul. He drags ashore the, the net full of 153 large fish, which was a, it was a haul large enough that one would have expected it to have torn the net. And, but it didn't. Okay, so these people out who do this, these fishing, you know, writing right in this context, they said, you got that many large fish in the kind of net we use, and you can be sure it's going to be busted, that something's going to happen to the net. That didn't happen here. Well, he drags, he, he drags that in, and Jesus then invites them to come and have breakfast, where he gives them bread and fish. And then John says the, the disciples knew it was the Lord, Yet he says that none of them dared ask him. They know it's Jesus, but none of them dared ask him, who are you? And you're thinking, okay, they know it's Jesus, so why do they want to say, who are you? And I think what's going on here is they're wondering who he is in terms of how the resurrection may have affected or altered who he is. That's what I think they're interested in. They want to ask him about the details of his resurrection continuity. I think they want to know how has being dead and being raised to life, how has that changed you? How has that transformed you? How has that affected you? But they're reluctant to do that. They don't dare to ask him that because they don't want it to be uh, like they're doubting that there is continuity, that they're doubting that that is in fact Jesus. So they know it's Jesus, but there's some reluctance for them to say, who are you? And that's how I understand that, is that what they want to know is who are you in terms of how have you changed through the resurrection experience, but they don't want to say that because in saying, who are you, Jesus will be sitting here saying, I'm Jesus. And they don't want to give the impression that they doubt the continuity. They know it's Jesus. So in any event, they just don't dare ask him about it. And then John notes, he says, this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And by this, he means that this was Jesus' third appearance to a group of apostles. The first two in, in John 20, 19 to 23, and then in John 20, 26 to 29, where he, he comes and he greets, he, he appears to the assembly or the, the group, okay? There are other individual appearances, obviously, that we know about. So that's what he's talking about there. And then we have in 21, 15 to 24, it says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd or tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die, yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now, after they had finished breakfast, after they had eaten this meal, Jesus asks Peter, do you love me more than these? And the referent of these is unspecified. Do you love me more than these? Now, theoretically, he could be asking if Peter loves him more than Peter loves the other disciples who are present. Is your love for me greater than your love for your fellow disciples? But that makes little sense, right? I mean, given how Jesus has urged them to love one another, he's all about them loving one another completely and fully. So the idea that he'd be asking, well, do you love me more than you love? He wants him to love the brothers and sisters completely. So that doesn't seem like the right, right way to read that. And he also could be asking if Peter loved him more than he loved the things, the boat, the net. Do you love me more than, these, than you love these people, your, your brothers here? Do you love me more than you love these things, more than you love the boat, more than you love the net, more than you love this whole enterprise? Theoretically, he could be asking him that, but as J. Ramsey Michael says, no such love for material things has played any part in the story. So, I mean, that would really be like an asteroid from nowhere, right? I mean, this thing just dropping in out of nowhere. That doesn't seem to be right. Now, what Jesus is almost certainly, in my judgment, almost certainly asking Peter is whether he loves him more than the other present disciples love him. Do you love me more than they love me? Is your love for me superior to their love for me? Now, if that seems as an odd question, I think that's right. I think that's what he's asking because it's probably rooted in Peter's earlier suggestion of his superior devotion. Peter has previously indicated that his devotion to the Lord was in fact superior to that of the other disciples. That's recounted in Mark 14, 29 and Matthew 26, 33. Even though they all fall away, I will not. Right? Look, even if they all fall away, not me, baby. Why? 
because my love and my devotion is superior to theirs. It's greater than theirs. So I think that's what's behind it, you see. And having been humbled by his denial, Jesus has him indicate before some of his fellow apostles that he is now beyond that sense of superiority, which may have increased their love for him and therefore aided his future role in the group. Having him acknowledge that, that I'm beyond that sense of superiority that before my denial I clung to and I, I, I said, though I'll fall away, I won't. Well, I've had a new enlightenment <laughs> with my denials. And so he comes off that sense of superiority and Jesus has him saying this in front of the people he's going to be influential with. He's going to be working with these other people in spreading the gospel, and I think that's what he's doing here. So Peter won't say that he loves Jesus more than the other apostles. Do you love me more than they love me? And he won't say it. He doesn't say that he doesn't, but he won't say that he does. He won't say that. All he will say is that he loves him and that the Lord in his insight, with his insight into the human heart knows that he loves him. So he says, you know, do you love me more than he, he just says, oh, look, I'm not going to say that. I'll, look, I love you and you know I love you. You know, I'm not going to say that. I said that at one time and I've now had the experience of seeing how that was, seeing how I denied you. So he just says, listen, I love you, and that's what I'm saying. And you know it, you know my heart, and you know that I, that I love you. So then given Peter's love for Jesus, Jesus tells him to feed his lambs. Peter is to care for the Lord's flock. He's a leader here in the church. He's to care for the Lord's flock, meaning his disciples. And the Lord asked him the same question two more times. And you've undoubtedly in your life heard stories or sermons, lessons that have made a big deal out of the shift in the verb that is used. So we ask him three times, do you love me? Two times he uses the verb agapao. The third time he uses the verb phileo. And you've heard people, oh, you know, see, the, the, attribute a great significance to that. I, I don't think that's right. I think he's asking him the same thing essentially, and it's simply a stylistic variation. He simply alters the verb that he uses to keep from repeating it. Here's what Edward Klink says in his commentary. Contemporary scholarship has almost unanimously concluded that there is no intended difference in meaning by the verbal alteration. It is simply a stylistic preference for using different but synonymous words rather than repeating the same word. If you've written it all, you know that, you, you know that desire. You don't want to just keep you know, using the same thing, so you substitute synonymous words. And I think that's exactly uh, what is going on here. So now each time Peter answers, though, in the same way. So he asks him essentially the same thing. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter answers the same way each time where he says, except the last time he says, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. And then the third time he adds, you know everything. You know that I love you. See, calling on the Lord's insight into the human heart. And it says that Peter was grieved. He was grieved that, that the Lord had asked, asked the question a third time, asking him this thing through. Why is he grieved? Well, it's probably because in confessing his love for Jesus three times, in doing that, Peter recalled vividly his denying of the Lord three times. That's what, that, you see, when he got three times, that's not an accident. Why is he doing that? 
He has him confess his love for him three times, and in doing that, Peter is reminded vividly of his denying the Lord three times. And this presumably was done by the Lord, you see, to assure Peter and the others of Peter's complete acceptance and reinstatement. Yes, he had denied he'd done this terrible thing where he turned his back, this treachery, cowardly, where he denied the Lord. So by doing it three times here, he makes absolutely clear his complete acceptance despite that, his reinstatement despite that. It was a symbolic undoing of his three denials. You see, so it's, it's, a, it's to be a blessing to him. How, sh- how ashamed he was that he had denied the Lord three times. So the Lord comes in, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you see, Peter? I know. I know. Forgiven. What I need of you, what I need from you, is for a devotion that will serve and tend and bless my people. There's a mission ahead. And you are completely restored, accepted, reinstated, both for Peter and for his brothers who are seeing this, that they may know. Yeah, yeah, whatever Peter did, I don't want to hear any more of that. We were there when the Lord said, come on, man. See, when the Lord said that. And then Jesus first tells Peter, he tells him to feed his lambs. And then after Peter's response to the second question, he tells him to shepherd his sheep, or is rendered here, they render it tend his sheep. And after Peter's response to the third question, he tells him feed his sheep. And these are just stylistically different ways of saying the command to care for Jesus' disciples. To care for his disciples, to bless his disciples, to feed his disciples, to protect his disciples, to function in the body of Christ as a shepherd. And in that light, I think it's interesting to consider Peter's words that Peter wrote later in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 4, where Peter says, Therefore I urge the elders among you, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a sharer in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God. What's what the Lord had told him to do, right? So he takes seriously this role, this leadership responsibility for your brothers and sisters, for caring for them, for looking out for them. And that's what he says here, shepherd the flock of God that is with you, exercising oversight. It's in brackets because there's a textual issue there, but I think it's there. All right, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly according to God, not with greed for material gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over the allotted ones, but being examples for the flock. And when the chief shepherd is revealed, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now, Peter will need all the devotion to the Lord that he's just confessed in carrying out the Lord's command that he care for the sheep because as a good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, Peter's leadership in the church will lead to his execution. Now, how's that for an assignment? I want you to shepherd my people And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And in your case, that is going to mean your execution, Peter. How's that for a job assignment? But that's what he tells him. He tells him that. He's going to leave that. Jesus tells him that in contrast to his younger days, when he's old, he will be in a situation in which he lacks personal autonomy. You see, rather than girding himself, rather than binding up his own clothes in preparation for some action and going where he chooses to go, rather than that, someone else is going to stretch out his hands 
bind up his clothes for their purpose and take him where he does not want to go. Right? Now, it's possible that this stretching out of his hands, it's possible that that refers merely to his extending of his hands as preliminary to arrest, to be led away. It's possible that it's extending to his hands in a kind of plea for mercy type stuff. But many people think that it is clearly a reference to extending his hands out as they are nailed to the cross beam in crucifixion. And in fact, we have very good evidence that Peter was crucified in Rome during Nero's reign. And so here's Jesus saying to him, this is what's in store. Now John, he comments that Jesus was showing by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. And Jesus said to him, follow me. He says, follow me. Carson says, Jesus' words tie this step of discipleship to Jesus' initial call, 143, where he says, follow me. Challenge Peter to consistent discipleship until the martyrdom he now faces comes due. And implicitly invite every waverer, every reader to the same steadfast pursuit of the risen Lord. Do you see what Christianity is? Do you see the radicalness of the submission to the Lord Jesus Christ that is involved? That is what Christianity is. It is not some casual bebop thing. Oh yeah, yeah. I, 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 it is a surrender of your life to the one who purchased you even to the point of death. He called him the kind of death by which he would glorify God. Death in the name of Jesus Christ. So Peter turns and he sees John. I'm going to have to race through this because I heard that bell. So he, he turns and he sees John and he says, well, what about him? If crucifixion or martyrdom is in store for me, what about this guy? What's in store for him? And Jesus tells him essentially that that's not his concern. Christians live in different settings and circumstances. Not all Christians are called to the same thing, right? He says, look, if it were the case that I chose to have him stay alive until I return, you are still you. You are in your situation. You are to be faithful wherever you are. You don't turn around and say, well, this person wasn't called to that. So therefore, that's not my calling in life. No, your calling wherever you are is to be a faithful disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your situation and circumstance may vary from other people. You may be called to martyrdom, as Peter was. John may not be. And he says here, if I chose to leave, and so because of that, this is how this rumor gets started, that John's never going to die. And John puts the kibosh on that right here. He says, Jesus never said I was not going to die. He only said hypothetically that if I chose to keep him alive until I come, what's that to you? Okay, so that's how that got started. And he then says, that's not exactly uh, what's going on. 21, I, I heard that. All right, so let me just read this and then I'll stop. He says, last, he says now there are many other, other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, this is obviously hyperbole to, ex to show the greatness of Jesus. He did so many wonderful things, so amazing. That he says that if every one of them to be, were to be written, I suppose that the world itself couldn't contain the books that would be written. He's done so many things, so amazingly, that he hyperbolically says you couldn't write so many books. All right? That's the Gospel of John. Hope it was helpful. Next week, Lord willing, we'll begin to study the book of Daniel.